Your Creative Push, episode 276. If it feels really hard, but you still want it, then that needs to be the thing that you put all of your focus and energy into getting. Welcome to Your Creative Push, the podcast that pushes you to pursue your creative passions. I'm your host, Youngman Brown, and my guest today is Amber Kane. Amber is an educator, a textile designer, and an entrepreneur. She was a high school art teacher for eight years until she decided to quit that job and move into an abandoned house. And that is the story that she comes on the show today to talk about as well as her other creative journeys. She talks about her first years working as a teacher and the pushback that she was getting from the school, which led her to her eventual decision to quit her teaching job and move into an abandoned home. And then the early process of getting settled into the new situation that she had kind of flung herself into, for lack of a better term. Amber also talks about how her textile design business started and the power in being a teacher and a working artist at the same time. And then she gets into some really cool stuff about uh, creative resistances and how to get past them. She has this trifecta that I don't want to spoil for you, but I'll talk about that at the end of the episode as well. So listen for that. Just an inspiring talk with an inspiring artist, an inspiring teacher. Uh, And she did something that I think a lot of us daydream about doing uh, in our day jobs. So I know that you're going to enjoy this, my conversation with Amber Kane. Enjoy. Amber, welcome to Your Creative Push. Thank you. So I always like to give my guests an opportunity to have the floor to, to sort of give a, a brief bio, sort of how you got to the point you are today uh, in your life or in your creative life. Okay. So um, to try and keep this not to be super, super long, <laughs> um, so I kind of consider myself one of those lucky people that my entire life I knew what I wanted to do. So I always knew that... I wanted to be a teacher, and so I followed a very direct path of um, going and getting my art education degree, and right out of college, I got a full-time high school teaching position, um, which many people would consider very lucky, and I did at, at the beginning as well. And so it kind of seemed like I had just landed my dream job at the age of 22. Uh, however, during my eight years of teaching within the public school system, I um, It was kind of anything but a a dream job, which I think is normal for an art teacher, have a lot of ideas. I love trying new things, challenging my students, and I kind of quickly found that I was in a work environment that that was not the type of person that they were looking for, and I was getting called down to the principal's office all the time. And Yeah. (laughs) Which was actually really new for me because when I was in high school, I was a totally, you know, good, well-behaved student. Mm -hmm. So, and I never, I was getting called to the principal's office even though I hadn't really done anything in particular wrong, but it was really working to try and get me to kind of fit within the box and to stop trying new things and to stop pushing boundaries and... So uh, within the public school system, depending on where you work, you always get tenure at some point where I was, you got it after three years. So I attempted to behave myself enough to not get fired for the first three years, Mm. which I succeeded at. Uh, And once I got tenure, I tried to push a little bit more with, with my new ideas. And that continued to get me in trouble. I tried a year of I guess I would call it being a mediocre teacher, uh, <laughs> going in and working the hours that I was required to work and you know, keeping my students under control, getting the paperwork done when I was supposed to get it done, which I didn't really get called down to the principal's office that year. So in that way, we could call it successful, but I was not proud of what I was doing. So I tried one more year of like really going for it, which ended up I got a letter in the mail that was basically reminding me that my position could be cut at any point in time Mm. because art isn't required. So Mm. even though they couldn't fire me because I hadn't done anything technically wrong, they could actually just cut the entire program. 
And that was kind of the weight that was put on my shoulders. So once I got that letter and I'm normally a pretty like even keeled individual, my husband watched me like turn into like first I was bawling and then I was just raging with anger. And we decided I was going to do one more year of teaching. And during that year, uh, we were going to figure out a new plan uh, while my husband uh, he, he does work at that point in time. I was the one that carried our health insurance. My paycheck was paying the mortgage payment, all of those things. So it was going to be a really big, uh, upheaval of what in the world am I Mm -hmm. going to do? So for the first time in my life, I was like, Oh, I always knew what I wanted to do. And now I have no idea because I felt like I didn't even want to teach anymore. I was just so, incredibly miserable. So my husband and I both had grown up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania and moved away for my, for my job. And I decided that maybe we could move back there. So I started looking at houses in Lancaster city and found an abandoned home. It had been foreclosed three times already. And convince my husband that we should just put in a really low offer for this house, which he thought would get t- turned down and it did not get turned down. So <laughs> when I told him they accepted our offer, he, um, was, I think he said some bad words. He was like, <laughs> could not believe that that just, <laughs> oops, <laughs> no, oops, that, that just happened. <laughs> uh, and so that was what like really officially set like, this is happening. We just, now we have two houses. So we put our other house on the market. Uh, it sold pretty quickly, which was wonderful. We actually rented from the people that bought it for a couple months so that I could finish the school year. And because the house that we bought was like not ready to remotely move into, but we ended up moving into it with, we had no electricity. Uh, we did not have a kitchen. We had like running water, but we didn't have any hot water. Hmm. And, uh, so that was kind of when I tell people that I'm like, that is how desperate I was to leave. Like I set myself up in this home that was basically a shell of a home, uh, so that I could quit everything. Cause it was a much cheaper house than what we were selling. And then what was that like? <laughs> um, there were, so the first night we got here, we, threw our mattress on the floor and used like headlamps to find some pillows and blankets. And when we laid down to go to bed, uh, there was like, it was really, it was really loud. So the cars driving by were like blaring music. And in that moment I was laying in bed, like, I'm pretty sure my husband is going to leave me because I just drug us into this insane situation I can sleep through anything. So it does that like noise does not bother me. He cannot sleep through anything. Uh, So there was a real, there were kind of for probably the next year, a lot of moments of panic of what did I actually get us into? And then questioning myself of, was it really as bad as I thought this was a, really terrible idea. And then moments of like, this was a wonderful idea. (laughs) Um, because I wasn't grinding my teeth anymore. I didn't have headaches every day. I wasn't throwing up from stress. So it was just kind of a, a very back and forth of, I'm not sure what I'm doing, but we had already done it. So we had to keep going. I think really for me, it was a, it was a terrifying thing, but like once we bought this house, um, there was like no, uh, there was no going back. And so we just had to keep pushing through and figure out, okay, like what's the next thing? How am I actually going to make money? How are we going to exist in this like living condition of, we don't even know what to eat. Cause normally my, my husband is the cook and he makes everything like a hundred percent from scratch. And suddenly we, we didn't have a refrigerator or a kitchen or anything. And so we would go to the grocery store and buy like avocados. Like we didn't even know how to handle purchasing food that is already made for you. Mm. <laughs> um, so all of that was just a very back and forth of this is exciting and it's going to be fine. And I'm really stupid. I should have just done what everybody was telling me to do. And 
like sucked it up and collected my paycheck and enjoyed my health insurance and like just stayed on board so that I could have a great pension plan. Like most people kind of thought I was crazy. Right. <laughs> well, no, crazy, but brave. Like there's, <laughs> there's also good crazy, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that's kind of the dream that a lot of people have. They just want to throw their arms up and quit their job, you know, right away and kind of just dive into this new life. But there are a lot of hardships, you know, and it takes a while sometimes if you do make that decision to find the path. Um, so take us through that. Like, where did you start to see the light, I guess? Yeah, well, like very literally, we would get electricity in one room at a time. <laughs> that's a way to see the light yeah so one like perspective changed really quickly because we would get super excited um like oh my gosh we have a ceiling fan in this room and some light so that's super exciting um and like six months into it I think in October we actually got hot water so that was um that was pretty thrilling so there were potentially some really low bar set of what became exciting to us. Um, some good things that I already had in place. So before, like I left without a plan, but sort of had a plan. So we had figured out a way that we could, we could live based off of my husband's income. So I was already doing some teaching online and I had my textile business kind of running. Um, and I had a a part-time, um, administrative assistant position at a local art college. So what, started to happen, which is not at all what I anticipated to happen, but probably that's the biggest lesson to learn. Even if you think you have some kind of a plan, when you like fling your whole life up in the air, um, you're going to be wrong. Um, is so I started to realize, um, especially in my position at the college where I did have, I was working for people. So I had a boss is really how damaged I had become from my last position. And so I started to realize like anytime something didn't go like perfectly, I was like waiting to get in trouble. And the day it really hit me, I don't even remember what happened anymore because it was not actually a big deal. But um, I was like bracing myself to get in trouble. And instead my boss like walked in and he had like bought me coffee and actually remember that I like cream in my coffee and not sugar. Um, and kind of in that moment, I realized how important it was that I had left the last position because I had become so programmed to always, always prepare to get in trouble and always prepare to be threatened that I was living my life a hundred percent in fear and on the defensive. And that realization also somewhat kind of slowed down what I was planning to do in my, my life and my business, because I realized I actually, I needed a little bit of a safe space to process the last eight years. Cause that was really my, that was my first eight years of like, you know, working as an adult in a professional workforce and reprogramming my thinking of how I responded to myself and how I responded to people that I was either working with or working for. Um, My original intentions was not to be an administrative assistant for three years. I mean, I have a a bachelor's degree in art education and a master's in in creativity. So um, that was not the plan, but it ended up being something that I really needed to be able to get to a place of understanding how you actually should be treated when you work for people or with people and understanding how to stand up for myself, that you can stand up for yourself and not always get in trouble. So that was kind of probably the biggest realization for me and a very long process that I was not anticipating having to go through. But once I had removed myself from the situation, it just kind of slowly but surely revealed itself of how damaged I was and how much of myself and my voice I had let go that I really needed to work on getting it back. 
Mm, absolutely. I, and I think that's something that a lot of people experience when they do start doing something, or creative people specifically, when they start doing something that they don't uh, necessarily enjoy, or if it's like, it's not their long term plan, but it's like something they're doing to start. It's like this thing that you're like, okay, like, I still have my creative juices, but like every day it starts to grind away. And you talk about reprogramming. I think that is the worst thing for a creative when um, you're always prepared, like you said, to get in trouble for trying new things or being creative, which is like literally your job <laughs> as an art teacher. Like right. It's literally what you're supposed to be doing to like shape these minds to think in different ways and to express themselves. So how long did it take you to kind of reprogram your brain back to the the good Amber? <laughs> yeah, um, I actually, I think it's really probably been within the last six months that I really started to feel like comfortable using my voice again, confident in the knowledge that I have and the experience that I have. Uh, Cause I still would, would continue to kind of see myself shrinking away from, you know, even, even sharing that I was an art teacher or sharing my, my experience just because for so long, uh, that actually, that just got me in trouble. It wasn't, it wasn't a good quality of mine. And so, yeah, it was kind of what you said. It was working on aligning that I am a creative person a hundred percent. And so how do I accept that part of me? And, you know, I, I have to give a lot of that credit, uh, I mean, to my family, my husband, but really the, the art college that, I work at and even, you know, when I would introduce myself as like, yeah, I'm the assistant. Um, my boss literally would be like, stop underselling yourself. Like you are not just my assistant. Like you are all of these other things. And I realized I was kind of doing that as a way to protect myself and it was, and it was easy, but probably about, yeah, I think six months ago I started to, when I started working for the art of education, so they, they, uh, do online courses specifically for art teachers. Um, and it's an just awesome group of people to work for. So the more kind of groups of people that I got involved with that think like I do, um, love new ideas and hard workers, um, uh, made me realize that, you know, there are other people out there like me and mm -hmm. it's fine to be me. And so, that kind of allowed me to really merge back into being myself once I put myself in environments of people that also thrive on ideas and trying new things and asking questions, which this literally, this just happened. I had decided I needed to, to, to leave the assistant position because it was, it was good for what it needed to be, but it was time to push myself back out into the world. Um, and so uh, in the process of all of this, my, uh, my boss actually took another position. And so I'm leaving that administrative position and I'm becoming the director of continuing education. So kind of, um, I have really reached a point that I am kind of pushing myself back into being in charge, um, and allowing myself to express my ideas and put my ideas into action and see what happens. Very cool. Welcome back to the, to the real creative world, Amber. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I wanted to talk about, cause as all this is going on, you have a textile design business going on too. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk about that. Sure. So, uh, as kind of almost all of my side businesses, they happened somewhat accidentally. So when I was, was started my teaching position, I was weaving just for fun, just as a way of making art on my own. And then people that I was working with kept asking if they could buy my work. And, you know, I guess there's only so many textiles I need to have. So I started to sell my work. Um, and then that was really lining up with me wanting to get out of, out of teaching. And so 
during that point in time, I put a lot of time and effort into my textiles and started selling online. I was doing a lot of high-end craft shows. I started doing um, trade shows. So for people that don't know the difference at a craft show, you're just you're there with your work selling to the, the consumer. Um, a trade show, you're going with your work and you're actually dealing with buyers for stores. So they're looking at your work and placing orders to actually carry your work in stores. So for a while, my real focus was to leave teaching and to be a textile designer. I shared a gallery space with uh, jewelry designers for about a year and a half. And kind of ironically, what happened is I was really pushing and growing the textile business while I was teaching. Once I quit teaching, um, I realized I still had a love for creating and designing textiles, but I hated doing craft shows. So I hated the like packing all my stuff stuff up and standing in a 10 by 10 booth for like 10 hours a day. And so I, I started to let that go. Now I just sell my work online and I sell at a, at a local boutique in my city, which I love. So it allows me to kind of keep that going, but I've really decided that's going to be this kind of smaller side thing. I had been pushing it so much because it seemed like that was my answer. That was how I was going to get out of teaching. And once I got out of teaching in kind of the, the, the three years uh, after I left my public school position, I realized I never wanted to get out of teaching. I wanted to get out of that environment. And so I actually do a lot of teaching now, just in many non-traditional ways. And so the, the textiles were there to save me, and they did do that. And I have no intention of fully stopping it. I think, one, it's, it's a great to be an art teacher and a, and a working artist. There's a lot that I can learn and share with my students and to, you know, to be an example and I just love creating, but I've actually let go. I don't do trade shows anymore. I don't do craft shows anymore. I took all the things that I didn't like out of the textile business and stopped doing them um, and only do the parts that I, that I love doing because the craft show was like, I never liked doing, but because it was going to get me out of a thing I liked doing even less, mm -hmm. I was willing to do that. Yeah, I think people can relate to that because it's you have this thing that you love to do uh, and if you hate the other thing that you do uh, the, the this creative outlet um, and you're trying to make that creative outlet into like your new thing your new job um, when it once it starts to kind of feel like a job <laughs> or feel like this thing that you're trying to do and create a new job you lose that passion for it so what what did that do for you when you uh, were able to kind of release or or, or let the the old job kind of release its grip on you? Yeah, I think one, it was, it was just really freeing and I was able to move back into designing a little bit more and how I really like to design. So weaving is not a fast process in any way, shape or form. So even when I was working on going into stores, that's complicated uh, to even be able to fill enough orders in the way that I actually like to create. So I don't, I, don't, I do everything by feel, which is not super traditional for weavers either. I don't follow any patterns. I don't count any threads. I hate repeating designs because my interest in weaving is actually kind of that process of discovery. And so if I've already figured out how the colors are going to interact or how the pattern is going to turn out, I don't have a lot of interest in actually making it. Um, so that makes when you're trying to push into stores or just really a lot of production, that's kind of complicated to be able to make enough work um, and then to be able to communicate that to stores. So when I was doing that, there were a lot of compromises that I was making and making designs simpler and easier to repeat. And I was making multiple of one design, which I didn't like doing it. I was just capable of doing it. So when I decided that 
I wasn't going to go in that direction anymore. I really just gave my myself permission to go back to approaching it uh, much more with an artist mindset of make whatever I want to make. And, you know, so what if the embroidery takes me 72 hours? I like to embroider and that is what I want to add on to the piece. <laughs> so it really changed my perspective in that because – well, of course, I think any artist enjoys selling their work. So I'm not going to say I don't like when my work sells. Um, I also, I don't need it to sell. So while it's okay if a piece takes a year to sell because it's like a $500 scarf, that's fine. It's kind of just extra for me. And so I think it's it made me fall back in love more with that process as well because part of the reason I think I've always been drawn to weaving, I love incredibly repetitive tasks and time-consuming things, and weaving is all of those things. So, Because um, I also tend to do a lot of surface design, like embroidery to my pieces after they, they come off the loom. And that, again, when you're doing it by hand, it's just slow, but... I'm a really, really happy person if I can sit and like tie French knots for five hours a day. So I, I gave myself permission to go back into doing that. And um, it's fine because I'm not trying to convince stores to, to carry the work. And I don't have like a certain amount that I have to sell or produce to be able to pay my bills. Looking back at like the whole situation, and I know it was like a, a rough uh, transition, <laughs> especially with no, I couldn't live without hot water or electricity, but <laughs> that's just me. Um, like, do, do you have that like feeling of like that it was like this romantic time, uh, or is it still kind of this thing that was like, oh God, like still kind of have the shudders when you think back to uh, like how hard it was? Yeah, I'm not sure it's ever going to be a romantic time. I'm still glad that I did it. It seems kind of like funny when I think back on it right now <laughs> of like, I can't even, um, my husband is, which like is a wonderful balance to me. He's one, he's like very, very logical and strategic. Um, he would like never call himself a dreamer. So I'm, I think most of the time I'm more kind of fascinated that I actually convinced him that this was a good <laughs> idea because normally I will come up with kind of like the crazy idea and then he will, you know, kind of bring me back into reality. Um, even looking at this house, I, I came and I was like, this house is awesome. I can have all this studio space and like, we'll design you a new kitchen and like, it's just going to be it's easy and awesome. It needs some paint and whatever. And he was just like, you have got to be kidding me, Amber. Like this house needs everything. Like we can see the sky through the roof. So I don't know how I convinced him that, the, that any of this is a good idea other than I guess I really like was as miserable as I think I was. And he was like, we, we've got to do something. So yeah, I don't want to ever, I don't think I ever want to relive it. It was an adventure. I learned a lot, but a lot of it was not really fun. Yeah, I hear you. Well, props to him for, for doing that. But yeah, I guess he saw how desperate you were and desperate times do call for desperate measures. Yeah. So well, congrats to you. Are you guys still in that house? We like, are. Did you fix it up? Or? Yeah. Wow, nice. Um. So what's funny, I still like this house more than he does. So he would rather like live in the middle of nowhere and we live in a city. Uh, I mean, it's a very small city. Like if someone from New York came here, they would be like, this is not a city. But um, <laughs> <laughs> so I refer to this house sometimes as like our freedom house. And he's like, you're a crazy person. Because for me, it really kind of let me become myself because we were able to get it so cheaply. Like that's what really allowed everything to like kind of fall into place. And we were, I, I, you know, the benefit of a house that's like falling apart is you can really make it into your own space because it had to be redone. So I actually have, um, I have a weaving studio in this house and then I have a second studio that sometimes I, I teach out of, or it's just like this really giant space if I want to do some kind of really big projects. 
and he got a really nicely designed kitchen. So for me, it, it, it's, it's kind of this, this wonderful, like magical space. Um, I can walk everywhere that I need to go. And, uh, the neighborhood is actually a, a pretty diverse neighborhood. We have a high refugee population and I love different cultures. So I kind of love that, like, the car is driving by. We'll be playing all kinds of crazy different music. And I encounter lots of people speaking different languages on a daily basis. Um, so it's kind of like overall just a, a space that I really love. So I don't, I mean, we talk about it. I don't see us like leaving this house anytime soon. Our real our real kind of next dream, um, is that we would be at a point that, you know, we might go live somewhere else for like a month or two at a time and then rent this house out while we're traveling. Um, but I don't kind of, cause we don't have, we don't have a mortgage payment on this house. So that kind of, I'm like, that's awesome. Yeah. So we both <laughs> talk about freedom house. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we're both like, we, we don't want to go back to having a mortgage because there is a, a lot of freedom and like, I don't, we don't have any debt. So that kind of, I think is going to keep this place. All of our family is around here as well. So I think is going to keep this place as some sort of home base. What that kind of transitions to as we go forward. Um, I'm not sure. We also both, I work a mile away from here and my husband works like three miles away from here. There's a lot of, a lot of positives to it. You know, we'd love a bigger yard. Occasionally there's a little more crime than we love, but for the most part, it's totally worth it. Very cool. Well, I'm, I'm so glad that that worked out and it kind of, you're able to settle in and not have to like make another move. Yes. You know? <laughs> well, would you have any, lo- looking back, would you have any advice for anybody that maybe finds themselves in that position that you were in before where the job is just sucking the life out of them, even though it's supposed to be this job that like you have dreamed of. Uh, and you're, it's supposed to be a job that puts you in a position where you are able to be creative or able to kind of express yourself without getting into trouble. Um, would you have any advice to, to somebody else from kind of the, the lessons that you've learned? Yeah. So I have a couple ways I would think about it. And I kind of <laughs> went through all of these myself before I, before I decided to go. So one thing that was was really helpful for me just to, as far as making decisions, and this may vary depending on what type of work environment you're in, um, kind of a pro and con of public education is because of the union, it's not, it's not super easy to get fired. Um, so I say pro and con because I think uh, it also tends to sometimes protect people that that probably shouldn't be there. What I started to do when I was kind of getting in trouble all the time and then trying to balance out, like, how do I actually make decisions of whether I can do this or not? When I had a new idea, I would actually like write myself a termination letter. Like I would imagine if they were going to fire me for it, like what would they actually have to write? Um, and normally when I wrote that, I, it would really help to reaffirm this is totally ridiculous. Like I can't actually get in trouble for this. So that was a, a like helpful checkpoint for me. It also normally kind of like made me laugh and helped me feel like I had more power. Like I knew if they, if, if they tried to get me in trouble for that, um, it would never actually work. So kind of figuring out a way that you can make something sort of comical, but also make like bring it back to reality because part of, you know, the threats that were coming my way was continuing to pull it out of reality. And so I had to kind of keep, keep bringing it back to what could actually happen. I also, uh, at the start of every year would write down why I was teaching. So why did I care? Why was I showing up every day? And do everything that I could to make sure that my daily actions were lining up with that. Part of what made me leave was I realized I could not get my daily actions to line up with my why anymore. And so that was a really clear signal that I needed to get out of there. 
And then probably the biggest thing that, that pushed me and got me to leave was I started telling people that I was going to leave even when I totally did not believe that I was going to leave. Like telling my friends and family, like, I'm quitting. What was happening was they believed me. I had that solid support system. And so they kind of kept putting that into me of like, yeah, you're leaving, you're quitting. You said you were quitting at the end of the year where like in my head, I was like, I am not quitting at the end of the school year. That is terrifying. I have no idea what I'm going to do. Um, <laughs> And then ultimately, which this would be, you know, it's kind of a, a, it's a really big push um, is, you know, I went and paid cash for a house that uh, was not where I was teaching. So that was the real, the real ultimate push of like, oh, this is actually happening because we just bought a house. There were all kinds of rules tied to the house that we bought. We couldn't, even if we had wanted to, we couldn't turn around and rent it out to someone for the first two years. Like we had to live in it. So there were all kinds of rules tied to this that was like, I have to go live in that house. And that was kind of my ultimate, like, well, I guess this is happening because we just bought another house. So some is, you know, saying it over and over again, even if you totally don't believe it, then slowly putting things into place that force you to do it. Because, you know, I think when push came to shove at the end of the school year, had I not told everybody I was quitting, um, had I, you know, not bought this house, I don't, I don't think I would have quit. I think I would have chickened out and been like, I'm just going to hang out for the summer and it'll be fine. And it's not as bad as I think it really is. And I think I would have been I think I would have been stuck in that for a longer period of time, but it was set up that I didn't have any choice. Yeah. Sometimes those short-term goalposts of, okay, I just need, especially for a teacher, like I just need to make it to the summer and then I can catch my breath again. And then, then what, you know, be miserable again next year and just wait for the opportunity to catch your breath again. Uh, it's a, it's a dangerous kind of mindset to get in. I, everybody listens to the show knows that I love that idea of saying out loud what you want out of life, even if you have to convince yourself yeah. that you're going to do this thing. I think it's so important. Yeah. I was always like, why, why do they believe me? I do not, <laughs> I do not believe me, but everybody else seems to believe that I'm actually going to quit. So I, I guess I am. I don't know. <laughs> you got a good poker face, a good bluffer. <laughs> yeah. Before we let you go, I wanted to talk about the unstandardized standard. Uh, could you talk about that? Yeah. So um, I actually started that while I was teaching. Um, I was forced to proctor one of the state standardized tests, which is, you know, so I sit in a room with a group of teenagers um, and watch them like fill in Scantron sheets and, you know, read them predetermined instructions. While I was was doing this, you know, I already didn't agree with with standardized testing to begin with. um, But then it's another thing when you're like, you're forcing students to do something that you don't believe in and you don't actually think is good for them. Um, And so there was one particular boy that was He was sitting in the front row. He was just like really, really struggling, like, you know, did not understand the content, didn't know the answers to the questions. Um, So he kept trying to ask me questions. Well, you know, we're not allowed to answer any questions. And to be totally honest with you, I didn't even know the answer to the question. It was some kind of complex math that I (laughs) helped him even if I wanted to. So and he while he was taking this test, um, he was wearing a, a baseball hat, which is, you know, not allowed. You're not allowed to wear hats in school, but especially in that type of environment. So most of these students, I didn't actually know. They weren't necessarily students that were ever in my classroom. So it, it's a room full of teenagers that I have to force to take a standardized test that I also have no relationship with. Um, so that's a little bit complicated when it comes to discipline and <laughs> classroom management. And so him and I had made a deal that he could keep his hat on if he just like stayed in his seat and kept his mouth shut and like pretended to take this test. So um, then my boss came in and like walked over to the kid and just like ripped the hat off 
the kids had, which didn't end well. Um, so then the kid was mad and he took it back and tried to put it on. And it was kind of this, you know, this back and forth. I, you know, said to my boss, like, I told him he could, I told him he could wear his hat. Like we agreed it's his thinking cap. Like it is the only thing that is, you know, keeping him quiet and in his seat. And to me, that's a very simple compromise. Like I just have to let him wear a baseball hat. No one's getting hurt. But as with most of my, you know, brilliant ideas, uh, that was not acceptable. Like this kid was not allowed to wear his hat. And so I was sitting there and just really realized, like even telling this story, it like makes me want to cry. Cause I was watching these kids that were so uncomfortable and, you know, were feeling like they were stupid and then are acting up because they feel like they're stupid. And then because they're acting up, then we're just putting, they're getting in more trouble and like this terrible cycle of like, what are we doing? Who are we helping? I have no idea. And I'm forcing this on them. So that's kind of where the title of um, the website came from is that I really wanted to on standardize everything. It was a creative outlet for me in talking about education because I realized I had already known that most teachers don't actually agree with standardized testing and are just as frustrated as the students are, but don't know what to do because, you know, when we try to push back against it, we also get in trouble. Then I was talking to a lot of parents and um, in the age range where my friends are either all having children or soon will be having children. And so we started having all of these conversations of they don't know like what they're supposed to do about school for their kids um, because everything they're reading about public education or hearing about public education doesn't really sound what they like, mm -hmm. but they didn't know what to do. So the start of, of that site was really me trying to figure out like how to answer people's questions of, you know, if you're still going to send your, your child to public school, because for some people like that's, that's the best option that they have. And that's fine. Especially if you still feel like a uh, creative thought is important, then how do you deal with that? So what questions do you ask to the administration? How do you speak the, the language that they actually understand? Or how do you interpret the, what they're saying to you? So using that site to just uh, talk to parents, get some of my frustration out about what I was actually seeing in the system. Um, it's morphed over the years since I left public education into really creating resources uh, for art teachers. So finding ways of, of people that are in the system, which I, I highly respect the people that are that are still hanging in there. And so how can I, how can I give them tools? How can I give them encouragement that makes their job just a little bit easier? And then I also work a lot with homeschool students of how do I support that group of people? So kind of looking at the different paths that people may choose to take so that they can still develop creative thought and how can I support that based on my experience? Cause I'm in kind of a nice space of, I understand public education. I, I know how that system works. I know the language that they speak, but I also, I'm not in it anymore. So I'm not, I'm not afraid of getting in trouble for the things that I say. So I can, you know, I can look at education from a lot of different perspectives because of my experience and because I have the freedom to speak and so the goal of the site is to kind of support people in a variety of ways of how do we how do we develop creative thought? How do we celebrate creative thought? And how do we get our school system to acknowledge that it is a really important thing and then figure out how to actually bring it into the system? I think schools are when they're looking at 21st century thinking skills, they're acknowledging that uh, creativity is important or schools are trying to bring steam in. So they're including art, but they're not really understanding what that means. Like just having kids color doesn't actually mean that you are, you're really digging into creative thought. So um, I think we have this whole environment that really needs to be educated 
on what does quality art education actually look like and what is creativity and uh, how do we actually develop creative thought. And so that's what I'm trying to teach people. I love it. And I think it's so important because like the, that kind of brings us back to this, the whole like thesis of this, this talk where they were trying to get you to be a standardized teacher, <laughs> yes. you know? And I think it's like this whole system that like, um, for creative people can be very, especially young creative people can be very daunting, scary, and frustrating when you have all of these creative urges as you're growing up. And it's almost like they're stomped out of you, uh, mm -hmm. to become this like standard kid that can pass a test, uh, yeah. just so that you can kind of be a standard person in society and be plugged into uh, a job that doesn't require your creative impulses. And it's just like, I don't know, I think it can destroy the soul. <laughs> so yeah. I think what, what you're doing is very important. And uh, I, I we'll definitely link that up in the show notes page today for people to check out. Great. Cool. Um, well, we like to end the interview with giving you an opportunity to give the final push. And that's where I ask you to reach through the microphone and grab the shoulder of one of the listeners that you've already really inspired today and just give them your best final words of advice and really push them to pursue their own creative passions or their own creative life or uh, become unstandardized. <laughs> Yeah, so I think I would say I like to acknowledge first <laughs> to everyone, it isn't easy. And I think a lot of times we kind of get wrapped up in if it's not easy, then it's not the thing that we're supposed to be doing. And I think a lot of times it's actually probably opposite of that. If it feels really hard, but you still want it, then that needs to be the thing that you put all of your focus and energy in to getting. Um, and understanding that it may take longer than you want it to take, the path may be incredibly stranger than you expect it to be, but put all of your focus and energy into that thing that you do deep down believe in, and you'll get there if you keep going after it. I love it. Amber, thank you so much for coming on the show today, for sharing your story. It's a unique one. It's an awesome one. Uh, and for uh, giving us that push today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Of course. Um, and you can find Amber on her website, theunstandardizedstandard.com. And on Instagram, she has teacher.kane. And we'll have that all linked up at today's show notes page at yourcreativepush.com slash Amber Kane. Amber, thanks again. Thank you. Yay. My thanks again to Amber for coming on the show and sharing her story. This is one of those fun episodes that has a ton of talking points that I want to bring up at the end. Uh, sometimes I write down one or two things and then I just ramble on and on. So I'm going to try to get through this quickly because I have like five points that I want to make. Um, but the first one being stop underselling yourself. Uh, like Amber was saying, you know, you need, you need to be proud of being an artist and be proud of the thing that you're doing. Own it so that other people can really understand who you are and, and what you are or what you're trying to be. So if you're hesitant when you tell people and you undersell yourself, uh, that's how exactly how people are going to take you. They're going to take you for that unconfident artist, that person who's not uh, truly believing in what they're doing. But if you own it, you are that person in their eyes. Very important. Stop underselling yourself. And number two, if you're feeling underappreciated or frustrated with your creative job um, and you used to love it, just analyze whether it's the love that's diminishing. Like, are you getting bored of or, or tired of the art itself? Um, or is it the setting and the situation that you're just itching to get out of? Just really analyze whether the, the lack of love and the change of heart is coming from uh, your actual, like, have you graduated from this thing and you're, you're done creating? Like, you can't uh, further your kind of creative output? Or is it just because you're in a toxic environment that you need to get out of? And then finally was that little gem of a trifecta that I mentioned in the beginning of the episode. And I hope you guys caught it because there was three actionable things that she talked about um, that you can utilize today to either feel better about your situation or just to make the best of your situation. And the first was writing yourself a termination letter. And I think that this can go for anybody that's doing anything creative, whether it's your actual job or it's just kind of your own personal letter to yourself. Perhaps it's like a, a press release, like something that would be written in a newspaper about you. Would this thing actually happen? Would you actually get a termination letter for doing this thing that you're scared to do or you're questioning whether you should do or not? Would there be a press release about submitting your, your artwork to a, an art gallery and getting denied or, you know, 
sharing something on Instagram and people laughing at it. <laughs> Would that be newsworthy? And I think that if you wrote yourself a termination letter, you'd find it difficult to do so with a straight face. And I think when you can kind of put it into the real world and realize that there are no bad consequences that are going to happen from you doing this thing that you're scared of, I think that's a really effective tool to kind of bring it into reality. And then the second thing that she did was writing down why she was teaching at the beginning of every school year. I think that's really important to do, to keep checking in with yourself, to keep writing down your goals, what you want to get out of your creative life. And then if your actions during the day do not uh, correlate with that uh, thesis statement, then you're probably on the wrong path and you should start to uh, think things through or think about a change. I think it's always really important to get back in touch with your goals, what you want out of this whole creative life that you are making for yourself. And I think even if it's just every year, every month, every day even, just quickly jot down a few of your goals so that you can always make sure that you, your day, your week, your month, your year falls in line with what you want out of it. Because otherwise, what's the point? And then the last thing of that trifecta that she was talking about was telling people what you're going to do uh, before you're ready to do it. That's something we talk about all the time on this show, but it's so powerful and I love seeing it in action. When she told people that she was going to quit, people started to hold her accountable for it and the action just kind of just happened. She bought a house <laughs> and she ended up in a situation where she kind of had to leave that. I think it's important to start to say those things out loud. Just start putting it out there. Get other people involved, other people than just you and that voice in your head. I think you can never have a, an intelligent conversation with that voice in your head. So it's always important to bring other people in and bounce ideas off of them and also build that accountability for yourself. Whew. Okay, I think I got through that quick enough so that I didn't bore you guys too much. I really want you to find that inspiration and go and bring it into your own life, into your own creative life, and uh, really get that work done. On next week's episode, we have a best of episode uh, for two reasons, because one, it's long overdue and I have a long list of episodes that I want to get back out there that a lot of people haven't listened to. Uh, and number two, uh, the Eagles are in the Super Bowl. <laughs> I'm a big Eagles fan and actually uh, football in general, uh, fantasy football and just watching sports in general has been one of my sacrifices that I'm making uh, in order to uh, get to my own creative passions, this podcast and everything else that I'm trying to do. But I mean, it's the Eagles in the Super Bowl, so I'm going to really relish this week and really enjoy it. That's not to say that next week's episode won't be very inspiring for you because it is one of my favorite episodes, um, but that is for you next week. Wish my Eagles good luck unless you're a Patriots fan, in which case, meh, good luck to you. <laughs> Uh, but other than that, hopefully you were inspired to go and get your work done. So go and get it done, and we will be here for you next time if you need the push again. I love you all so much. Go Eagles. Go you and your creative passions, and let's crush this week. We'll see you next time, guys. Bye. Never miss a push. Head to yourcreativepush.com slash subscribe to find the easiest way for you to subscribe to the podcast.